Felix Gonzalez. What's happening, brother? Not much, man. Not much. Happy Sunday to you. Happy Sunday and happy Father's Day to you, my man. Appreciate that. How are you? I'm good. Shout out to all the dads doing their bid, making sure they're raising kids right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, any exciting plans for the day? What are you up to? Brunch. Brunch? Brunch. Got to have a good meal for the day. You know, we only get one day as dads sometimes, so take me out to eat. Good brunch. Yes, sir. Where are you guys going? I don't know. It'll be a surprise. I'll find out when I get home. They're surprising you? <laughs> yeah. The better. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. Is there a place where you usually go or... Well, you know, I like peaches and pears over here. I like to shop local in the neighborhood. And then there's Southern Bell a little further down Archer. So, but maybe a little fancier today. Yeah, I, uh, my favorite over here is probably uh, Three Sons. Three Sons, good too. Solid. Yeah, I like their soups over there a lot. They got a lot of different good ones over there. It's a little warm for a soup for me. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> I mean, I do that more in the winter, but I still do even now, you know. Especially if your meal comes with it, I'm just like, what hey, do you got? What free you got? soup. Uh, this is a gift for Father's Day, little Buffalo Trace. Ooh. Do you like whiskey? I sure do. This is a fine bourbon. Have you ever you ever had this before? I have not. Well, congrats. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Father's Day gift there. It's all you. Don't forget it before we leave. No, I will not forget... You know, I've been to uh, Yellowstone, so I've seen the buffalo up close and personally within 10 or 15 feet. They'll almost come right up to your vehicle and stuff like that. They're amazing animals. Yeah, I've never never seen a buffalo in person before. They're massive. Yeah, I mean, what do they weigh, like 2,000 pounds or something like that? If not more, if not more. They're just huge, like almost as big as, big as a car. Yeah. I mean, they're just massive, some of them. I wonder if they could literally just, like, smash your car if they rammed into it, like, knock it over. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's some videos of people's cars being pretty damaged as a result of the buffalo smacking into them. But if you mind your own business, they don't mess with you too much. Yeah. I've never been to Yellowstone either. That must be pretty cool. Been out there three times. It's a great place to go. Yeah. It's one of the great wonders of uh, the West. So was it, like... You're in your car through a trail most of the time, or do you get out and walk to, how does that work? So there's multiple entrances to Yellowstone, one according north, south, east, and west. I've always come in from the east, and then there's a circular main road, and then a couple of spurs to go to different areas of Yellowstone. So you don't really drive right through the middle or anything, but it's just one big loop that might take you about six hours to go around it's no massive. kidding yeah that's i mean that is a long time yeah i wonder like how many miles that is all the way or what yeah i don't know the mileage but you're only doing about 35 or 40 because again you got big ass buffalo that are popping out so you got to be careful in some of the spots bears all kinds of wildlife yeah i was gonna say i'm sure there's a bunch of different stuff out there yeah. There's no lights, so you got to go really slow, especially as it gets to be twilight and stuff, because if you outrun your headlights, you're off the road. Okay, yeah, so you got to take it, you got to be careful. Yeah. And is it a like a two way road, or what is it? It's a divided highway. So one direction, the other direction, that's it. So if a buffalo decides to, you know, cross the road, you might be waiting 20 minutes or so with the traffic back up for that sucker to cross. No kidding. Yeah, it's pretty intense. Well, we're on their territory out there, so <laughs> if you got to wait, you got to wait. You know? That's how that goes. So I will drink this in good health, my friend. Thank you. Yes, sir. I think you'll enjoy it. I've tried a bunch of different ones. And lately, that is my favorite. I don't think it'll change unless they can give me something that's more magically delicious than that. Right. Um, you drink uh, Maker's Mark? I do. Mm -hmm. I do like Maker's Mark, too. And although it's one of the more, like, well-known, maybe mainstream type ones, if you would call it that, that's a really good bourbon, you know? Yeah. It, it burns a lot. Like, Maker's Mark is a man's drink. When you drink that, you know you put some whiskey in your chest. You can feel that... Uh, Feel that burn, you know. Feel the ombre coming out. Yeah, you got to keep the inner <laughs> ombre uh, fiery, you know. Exactly. 
Yeah, and make it old fashioned with this tonight. Yes, sir. The um, yeah, no Maker's Mark. Like when I was younger, you think about taking shots and doing all this stuff, but that's something to sip on, you know. Absolutely. Like if it's been a long day, you want to relax, clear your mind, sit down, you know. That's a thing to do, it. and that's that's one of them too. I think you're really gonna like the flavor on that. All right, I'll give you a report back. For sure. Let me know what you think. It's like a. It has this like, you can taste the charcoal like, barrel flavor from it. It's mm. just real smooth. Cause I got uh, back there I have four roses, which is a good sipping bourbon. Basil Hayden's. One of my clients was telling me, oh, that's one of the best brands in in bourbons you got to try that out and i did and i it's it's not a bad flavor but it's pretty unique it has like a kind of a sweeter like a like a fruity hint but not fruity but it's like a sweeter hint when you first take it and then back there i got clark and sheffield which is uh that is benny's house brand that's theirs because they have a few different uh you know they got a vodka tequila or whatever they got but uh but well, that's a good one, too. That Clark and Sheffield for being, like, that one, the small one there is a single barrel. And that's about 30 bucks a bottle. But you can get the regular bottle for, like, 20 or something like that. Maybe even cheaper. The little the little 750 milliliter one's, like, 15 bucks. But it's better than most of the stuff you're getting out there, you know? Yeah. So much, so much liquor, so little time. That's true. And... I really don't have much time for it anymore. You know, this is a lot of this is more of a decoration. And if somebody's in here, you know, a guest or whoever is in here, client, if they want to have a little bit or whatever, that's fine. But for the most part, it's just busy all the time. You know, it's hard to stay, uh, hard to get buzzed during work and be effective. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, yeah. Or for some people, it might be hard to be effective without being buzzed at work. You know? There's a group like that, too. I know a lot of people like that, especially in the real estate industry. A lot of the people I know, like, they'll have a little bit during the day, you know, a shot or just something to drink while they're sitting there at work. And I kind of don't blame them because, you know, you're in real estate law just like I am. And it's been, I feel like the summer hasn't ended for like two years. Like the summer market, it's just been nonstop busy, you know? Well, we are in interesting times, right? So last year probably was one of my best years because everybody was moving out, upgrading, selling, and then buying. So the volume was just off the chain. And then this year it seems to be continuing. So as long as that happens, just stay on the grind, get it done. You know, I've been doing this long enough to have remembered the last time there was a big peak back in like 06 and 07. And so I just have a concern that perhaps uh, in the next 18 months, if things slow down, just want to be prepared for that just in case. You never know what's going to happen, so just grind it out. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, to your point, uh, last year was my best year so far. I've only had my office for five years now. Um, And, uh, you know, last year was my best year. This year's pretty good, too. Um, I feel like I've been working with a lot more buyers and sellers recently, but then I'm starting to work with more sellers now as well. Um, for a while, it was like a five to one ratio. I was working with a lot of buyers, man. And as you know, that takes a lot of work. It sure does. It sure does. Well, especially with their new buyers, you want to make sure that they understand the process too. So it's a little bit more um, intense customer interaction. Oh, absolutely, because they're new to the game. They're, you know, a lot of emotions, you know, and they're not sure what to expect, and uncertainty, you know, causes... Confusion. Causes, well, confusion, and just kind of, if they don't know what the next step is, then they're worried if it's going to go through at all, and it can be, it can weighs on them, you know, so... And then there's so much work that they have to do, because... They got to get their tax returns, bank statements, pay stubs, you know, all that stuff together, and um, get a financial colonoscopy, basically, right. before they get approved. I just really hope that, you know, this time around, as opposed to 06, 07, 08, 
is that they've made better loans, you know. I mean, back then they were giving out those garbage-ass loans, ninja loans, no income, no job, no assets. At least now the standards have been pretty good. Yeah. I think we have different fundamentals, even if the uh, market does slow down this time. Last year, the supply of cash was from those CDOs, those collateralized debt obligations that were being sold. And once that dropped out, a large part of the funding mechanism disappeared and the market tanked after that. So this isn't like that. And I agree with you. The underwriting fundamentals are a lot different. And I don't think we've got a large percentage of people who are going to be losing their properties. It's really going to be some folks who've got multi-units that have had these uh, tenants that they can't, you know, evict, collect rents from, all that kind of stuff. So I do expect about maybe 15 to 20 percent of some properties in some markets to come online and that might help balance things out, I think. Then again, BlackRock is buying up, uh, or is it Blackstone or whatever? They're buying up houses big time, too, and making massive rental inventory. So the market's being skewed for sure. Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. I don't know. I think I think it's Blackstone is the name. I don't, I don't know for sure. But, yeah, they're like the biggest real estate purchaser right. of private real estate right. for rental purposes and things like that in America. So if they're doing that, I don't know if they see, like a huge rental market going forward that they wanted to snatch those up. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, the fundamentals better this time around. Uh, the one concern that I've heard um, in the lending industry is that tax increases could price people out of the homes in terms of, you know, if a person could afford the monthly payment at thirteen, fourteen hundred bucks. But those taxes keep on going up. After a while, a person who, uh, many people in America, just the way it is, are living paycheck to paycheck, might not be able to afford the uh, the monthly payment going forward. You know, I've been practicing for 21 years, and a long practice cycle gives you a lot of perspective on the ups and downs of the markets. And here's what I see. Years ago... I used to be involved with politics and, you know, had opportunities to do some interviews for some political activities with a lot of the elected leaders. They really had this view that if you want to do business, you want to be successful, you have to be in Chicago. So no matter what we charge you, you'll come here and you'll pay it. Technology's really changed that. So now people are working from home especially. And you know, I could do the business in Chicago from a laptop in Florida, down in Sarasota or something like that. And so that's what people are doing. They're leaving. If anybody pays attention to their tax bill, especially if you're in Cook County, you might be shocked to really read how much indebtedness the local governmental leaders have hoist upon you. So for every house there is, it's got literally tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars of debt that the politicians have, you know, leveraged against your house. So the smart people are, you know, retiring, taking their money, leaving Illinois, which means that the rest of us who stick around are going to be stuck with the never increasing cost for, you know, property taxes. And they're going to go up. That's all they do is go up. So it's just inevitable. It's Thanos. Well, it's true. And, you know, when we're at these real estate closings, it is a, it's a happy time, you know, and I, I've been blessed to help so many fresh young faces get into their homes and everything. But I joke around and I tell them, I mean, you know, when you tell them, oh, your monthly payment on your loan won't change because you have a fixed interest rate, but your total monthly payment can go up if your taxes go up or if your insurance goes up. Right. And the taxes are going to go up, that they're going to continue going up. Um, you know, I, I don't know how much they're going to spread that out amongst other taxes besides property taxes, but certainly um, they're going to continue going up. And I don't know what the day of reckoning is going to be here in Illinois because we, I don't think we can declare bankruptcy. We could possibly get a federal bailout if 
there's appetite for that at the federal level. But our state pension and health care problems are the two biggest uh, problems we face. We haven't funded those for years. Politicians are putting the money in other places. Now we have maybe $150 billion of unfunded pension promises we made to state workers. And then likewise, another $50 billion of health insurance uh, promises to, to current and future retirees. So the taxes are just going to keep on going up. And that doesn't even include all the stuff that you were just mentioning on this when you see that second installment with all those local taxing bodies that that have all this debt too right so you know i think that people really just need to be more civically engaged maybe go to these meetings where they're doing budgetary meetings start looking through them people would be i think really surprised at how much promises have been made on their behalf for stuff that was not really needed that's probably outside the scope of what government should be doing I mean, you know, government's there to help people, but you can't have cradle to grave management of every single life activity from health care, child care, all the rest of it. Some stuff, yes, for the most vulnerable especially, but too many people on too many programs is resulting in bankruptcy for the rest of us. I mean, if you take a look at our average Chicago tax bill, let's say it's 2800 and you multiply that over the 30 years of a mortgage loan, I mean, imagine what you would do with that money. I mean, you could retire if you invested that. Yeah, and um, $2,800 is reasonable. Like, my mom over here in the neighborhood, I think her bill is between four and 5000 And it could be less with, you know, homeowner discount, senior discount. But 2800 would be fairly low. Right. I mean, there's some some homes here in Chicago that are a lot more than that, depending on your neighborhood. And also the suburbs are, are the taxes are high as hell, mostly because they don't have the tax base that we do. There's, you know, more homes here to tax, so you can keep each individual bill lower. And you have uh, the commercial and the industrial base to offset some of that. That's true, yeah. We have that as well. And and you're, you're very correct, because I had a friend, he grew up on the same street as me here, in Chicago and he bought a beautiful home in the neighborhood it's beautiful home and uh, I had a three-car garage beautiful brick home it was a contractor who owned it before him did everything custom on the inside just beautiful and he says you know what Brian for the you know seven thousand or whatever a year I'm paying in taxes he's like he moved to Indiana his taxes are like about a third of what he was paying here he has way more land, and he says, I can use that money to invest all other sorts of places, exactly to your point. Right. And keep the money that you make. Right. Especially because the kids were going to private school anyway. So it's like, why am I going to pay these really high taxes, and then my kids are going to private school, which in and of itself is very expensive nowadays, private school. I went to St. Joseph grade school, St. Joseph high school, both of which are now um, going out of business um because working people can't really afford it anymore you know it's yeah. kind of crazy yeah i did catholic grammar school fenwick high school i know it fenwick friars uh, that's right man did you uh were you involved in sports i was played uh football ran track wasn't good at either you know <laughs> <laughs> well you you look like you kept in pretty good shape man well you know you get older you gotta hit the gym every once in a while the nice thing about being a dad is that now my kids are starting to look at the weight room, and so it gives me an opportunity to go back and relive the glory days and try to max bench and squat and deadlift, so I've been doing a lot of that with the boys. I mean, you're stout, like you're you're slim, but you got, you know, you got some good meat on your bones there. You got some ammo in those guns over there. The gun show. Seriously, man. <laughs> do, do, you, do you hit the gym regularly? Probably four times a week. Yeah. The gut doesn't want to seem to go down, but everything else seems to be coming together. Same here, man. Right. The gut is the tough part. The right. guns, the guns and the legs, you can keep them together, but Right. I I wonder what like you'd have to do to like what your hormone levels would have to be at or whatever to really keep it like when you're a young man, when you're just like slim as could be, you know? It's got to be crazy. I think if uh, the introduction of Breer probably ruined that at some point, just those empty carbs and calories, just, you know, they get on, they don't want to come off. 
That's true, and you said you like the micro brews too, which are heavy. There's a lot of stuff in there to filter out. Yeah. That's at least with the American beers, like a Coors Light or something or Miller Light, they've been like triple filtered. Your your liver's got to do a lot of work to get rid of all the stuff that's in those craft beers that's not filtered out. You know, on the day of my death, they're gonna say, "What was your biggest regret?" And the answer will be all the light beer that I drank. That will be my biggest regret. Why? Well, because now you can buy all these craft beers. They have a different beer literally every single day, every single meal, if you chose. And never explore all of them. But I spent so much time on Miller Lite, ugh, High Life, MGD, and I feel like it's been wasted. Well, there's incredible amount of variety and choices for the craft beers here in Chicago. Yeah. Do you ever go to that uh, Imperial Oak in Wall Springs over there? Yeah, for sure. It's one of the better ones around here. Mm-hmm. Really good selection. I got some good sour beers too. Yeah, I don't, I don't really mess with the sours too much. I got a couple of friends who dabble in those or like those. But um, one thing that uh, has been suspended due to the pandemic, we're just kind of getting over now is uh, Lagunitas Beer Circus. Do you ever go to that? Yeah, the one over there. Their, their tap room, I think it's called, right? Well, yeah, they, they have the... Over there in Pilsen, they got the uh, brewery and distribution mm-hmm. over there, and they have that restaurant on Upstairs 4, but they have an actual beer circus that they do, and they used to do it right there at the, at the brewery, but they started going to... Uh, I want to say mckinley park or whatever one of those parks is that's over there it's a legit circus they have and they do this in other states too but it started here in chicago because you know lagunitas they got one in california they got you know whatever throughout the country and it's they set up tents they got music act comes in there's people juggling people going around on stilts and you just go around and the first few years i started going they had all sorts of different breweries from around Chicago. They would just, you know, hey, bring in your, we're just trying to promote beer here in Chicago. And uh, you'd end up drinking a bunch of different free beers because with admission, they would give you, you would either have tokens or they'd give you these little pull tabs that you take off your bracelet. But when you first arrived, the local breweries were just trying to promote their stuff. They're like, you don't even have to give us a, a ticket. You can just take my beer, yeah. please. Pretty much. They just wanted to, you know, grow and expand and promote their business. But if you haven't been to that, that's a good time. Well, any time I could drink beer is a good time. Beer is proof that God loves us and he wants us to be happy. Benjamin Franklin. That's true. And I, I wonder if that's a real quote or just something they attributed to him. Well, you know, if, if not, it's okay. Don't believe everything you read on the Internet, Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, because apparently, <laughs> like, Benjamin Franklin would have been probably the really cool guy to hang out with back then. You oh, know? totally. Total ladies man, jack of all trades, the world's most interesting man of his day. Yeah, he was probably one of the most interesting characters a lot. Like you said, you'd be hanging out, Benjamin Franklin walks in. Hey. Yeah, the ladies are around. <laughs> He's bringing, getting drinks for everybody probably. And he used to like to take, like, naps during the daytime, too, which is it's a really smart thing to do, you know? Like, you get burned out quick, or if you're juggling a lot or whatever, we're, like we do, it, it would help, you Latin know? Latin America's got the siesta. What's that? Latin America, they have the siesta. Well, Europe, parts of Europe have it, too, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was talking to a friend of mine from Spain, and she said the reason they do it there is just sometimes the heat's so bad because right. of where they're at that they just get exhausted and they need to take that break and recharge the battery. I think Greece does it too. Right. Yeah. But here, we just uh, grind ourselves into the ground until there's nothing left. And know? we have air conditioning, so that helps. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, I'm, I'm a little jealous that you're hitting the gym four times a week. Do, when do you go, like morning, evening? Yes, Sometimes I'll go in the morning, you know, just uh, get up at 5 or something, take a ride to the gym, good hour, hour and a half workout. And then other times I'll do it after the end of the day, get the kids, just go hit the bench. Well, that's awesome that, uh, you know, you got the young guys because 
they'll kind of keep you young and you're you're showing them the way and they're kind of like keep you motivated too because yeah. they're doing it you want to see them grow up big and healthy and strong right. so you know it's also good brian they see how much dad can put up because then they're like oh we thought you were fat and out of shape and i guess not <laughs> yeah yeah right. <laughs> like don't Show challenge the alpha strength. just yet. You know what I mean? You got a ways to go. And also, here's the the standard we're setting. Yeah. yeah. Well, my son, he max benched the other day. And I was like, okay, good. Add 90. That's what you did? Right. You had 90 on right. his? Just so he would remember. Just so he'd remember. I'm still up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, um, I haven't done bench press in years. I... I did exercise this morning before I came out here for the podcast, and this is the first time I've done one in the morning like this, but it is all good. It is our day. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I just have a little 20-pound uh, dumbbell. I got a 15-pound kettlebell. I'll do a different stuff with that, mm -hmm. and then I do a little bit of cardio too. I, I do this warm-up routine from the uh, Insanity videos. Yeah. It starts off with jumping jacks, and it's like side-to-side, -side, like Heisman football movements. Mm -hmm. Um, and different uh, movements at the end. but uh, It's high-intensity interval training. Yeah. Yeah, that stuff's good. It's better than running. Running's really hard on your joints and stuff, so the hit exercises get your cardio up really fast. They do, and I still kind of want to run. Like, I have a treadmill downstairs in the basement of this building, and I've been wanting to use it a bit because I did used to run, like, on concrete, which, like you said, terrible for your joints and i got knee problems as it is um so but i feel like the best shape i've been in, in my life is when i was running like that like run around the airport man that's what i used to do what? i mean i used to live two doors down from here and uh probably twice a week or something i mean each block is a mile so yeah, if you could run around side. the airport it's four miles and if you could do that that's a pretty good workout should take about 45 minutes to maybe an hour, just depending on your speed. My speed now would be pretty bad. Like, <laughs> it's a different kind of cardio. Like, right. I'm, I'm doing that insanity stuff, high interval training. Right. But when you have to move your entire body, all that weight, and with the stuff that's going on in your joints, you'll notice right away. You feel that in your chest and everything. You right. know, that's, it's a different to, you know, you, you said you used to do track, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's. That's the real. Like, if you can if you can run, anybody who's going around that airport, I look at them like, even the people that look like they're just starting out or whatever, I'm like, get after it, you know, like, good for you. I just don't want to ruin my joints because I just had ACL surgery a couple years ago. So, yeah, I think treadmill, probably still a decent amount of impact, but it'd be easier than me and running on concrete, I think. Yeah. Because at least I had some, like, shock absorbing type of stuff in there, I think. Right. So... But, yeah, no, I want to get back into it because the best shape I've been in my life is when I've been running, for sure. Yeah. Keeps you slim, man. It really does. You know, the thing about it is is that it's one of those things, okay, today I ran around the airport, took an hour, and then 55, 50, 45. So you start to take less time in between going to do run, then you need to breathe. And doing again and eventually try to get to the point where you could just run non-stop and just really cut that time that's a that's a good way to measure yourself as an individual sport you know try to figure out how far you could push and how quick you can drop that time if you can run that four miles around the airport without getting down to the like walking recovery right you're in pretty good shape yeah that's not bad that's not bad i can't do that I used to, not today. Well, you have to work your way into that because yeah. for me, just whether it's treadmill or running on concrete, that initial time after you do it for the first or second time, you're going to be sore for a good week. Like your your hamstrings, your your thighs, like everything. I get like real sore in the thigh area and right around the knees if I run and I haven't run in a while, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh... So the two main things that I wanted to talk about today were evictions, which we can delve into a bit, and then also concealed carry because you are a concealed carry instructor. I took my concealed cor carry course with you. Great instructor. I've been telling a lot of people 
you know, I've been giving out your name and just telling people like it was a great course. Like if you want, yeah, appreciate that for technical knowledge, but also just fun and the, the jokes and the stories that you wove in and uh, the videos you showed us during the course too, just all the crazy stuff that's happening out there with shootings and mm -hmm. different scenarios. Uh, it was all super helpful. So yeah, it's one of my favorite topics. Hey, you see, you seemed like it, like you're, you know, when somebody's, when they're good at something like that, it's, they have that passion for it. It definitely showed through. Yeah. Um, and then in addition to, like I said, I know you do real estate law. Do you, you still do a, a good amount of evictions? I mean, obviously that it's kind of been on hold, but that's still a, a thing that you practice in. Very much so. So I can't wait to get back to that. You know, the biggest thing is that with this pandemic, I think for a period of time, having a stay was probably not a bad idea. You don't want a lot of people moving back and forth. If you think about a move, you got moving trucks, people are at home. If And we didn't initially know what the deal was with the virus. So you don't want movers grabbing people's property with coronavirus splattered all over it, you know, moving them in and out. So I got it for the first few months, but it's been over since March of last year. So what do we have, 15, 16 months now? I don't think the government has any right to come in and to ban the enforcement of private contracts like this. It's, it's outrageous. For this long. Yeah. yeah, for this long. And it looks at this point it's going to go until August. I mean, if the cities are open, if the mask mandates are dropping, then the eviction moratorium should be ending as well. Yeah, and I believe to your point that the current... Um, moratorium on the eviction in Chicago is August, I think is what they're saying, or in Illinois, maybe. Well, it's a governor's general. order, so yeah, it's yeah. statewide. Statewide. Um, and I mean, another reason behind uh, the moratorium was also just that we were shut down and people were told that they couldn't work for a while, so how can... I think what they were trying to avoid was the civil unrest of people who were getting evicted out of their homes but couldn't do anything about it because they weren't working they didn't have the income coming coming in i mean i would think avoiding the civil unrest would probably have been one of the main reasons that they did you see civil unrest last year yeah so there was that anyways i know but i it, i think it had the potential to be a lot worse if you started kicking people out of their houses during all this too you know because a lot of them where are they going to go then on top of it you know you know, I think this speaks to a broader issue that we have as a society, which is we live very much in the now. I mean, our grandparents saved and saved and lived very humbly and modestly, and they were always had uh, money in a bank account. Nowadays, people would rather go and spend their money on frivolous things and not have an extra money in a rainy day fund. So when stuff like this happens, they're shocked. You know, whether it be as a renter to make sure you have at least a few months worth of extra money in the bank or, you know, as we do real estate, I always tell my clients, you should have at least six months worth of all of your living expenses, including your mortgage saved up. So that way, if something goes south with the house, roof, heater, whatever the case might be, you're not putting it on a credit card. You're not struggling. You get hurt at work takes a few months for a comp to kick in or something like that you want to have that money saved up it's a different level of thinking you know what is for sure and the thinking is a big part of that that's something that we need to work on as a society and there is ways to do that but there's other factors too there was a shift in society back in the 50s and 60s after world war ii where we had very good paying jobs, they had pensions, they were, the ability to save was much more and people had to and at that time, the state of mind was more of the people who had survived the depression of the, uh, you know, uh, the late 20s going into 30s and then they got hit with the World War. So these people were savers, they wanted to make sure they had it. Wages aren't what they used to be for a lot of working people so it is harder to save and then the availability of credit now is such that you can just spend, spend, spend. One of the problems is probably that they don't teach financial literacy to people uh, here in America. Most, like I said we earlier, a lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck. And think about what they teach us in the schools that we have here. You know, it's like they'll teach you these basic courses, whether 
it suits you to know this stuff or not, you, whether you're going to use it or not. It's just kind of like we're going to educate you just so you can get out there in the workforce and get this job or go on to college and then go get your job. But they don't really teach you some of the stuff that our parents taught us about, you know, saving for the rainy day or how to manage your money or how to invest and, and how to maybe not have to work like a s savage for the rest of your life, you know, just to, to retire one day, you know. You know, it's, there's, a, there's an old biblical story about saving up in the grain stores for seven years because there's inevitably a seven-year famine. And in order to save up and have enough to make it through, you just have to do the planning for it. Yes, yeah, schools probably can help and have a course or something like that. They should. But everybody in their hand has all of the history of the world, all of the knowledge of the world accessible through a Google command. So if people really wanted to step up and take responsibility on a personal level, you say, you know, okay, Google, how do I make a budget? I'm sure that a billion websites would pop up and just start clicking through and we can self-educate. You know, I come from a time where if I wanted to know something, my dad would say, well, that's what I bought those encyclopedias for. So go to the encyclopedia and you'd have to go and research it, card catalogs. I mean, it was labor intensive to undertake study of a subject now i can watch a youtube video and some of the top scientists are explaining string theory or whatever the hell else is there yeah i feel like we need a push into the direction of personal responsibility but i also feel that there's a lot of pressures um in the workplace i was just listening to a uh, rogan's podcast the other day and they had on some guests and they were talking about how Amazon and Walmart, like the things that they're doing to, the, the, basically one of the factors you deal with as a worker is the, praf, the profit maximization of the employer. And that's not to say that people shouldn't take initiative and go start their own businesses and stuff, but, you know, when you've done a certain thing and you're just dependent on that paycheck and you got a wife and kids, it's not easy. So the, the education one of the things that they should be doing in these schools more is education on financial literacy. Like I, the first time I had any kind of an economics course was in high school and it was just one course and that was all we really had. So if you didn't get it at home from your parents, like, like my dad was always about investing and, and saving as an immigrant, like he was savage coming over there from Ireland. He barely had a couple hundred bucks when he came here and, right. and ended up making it literally. He had to save just to get here. And then when he got here, he still only had a few hundred bucks, but it didn't i didn't um like internalize it and and feel it in a material way until i got older because when i was younger you know i had a good life with my dad here and I, there was a lot of things that he wouldn't give me so i saved to get them myself you know i started caddying at 13 and getting that cash money you know mm -hmm. i got the new bike i wanted to get the new stereo system with the, you know big old booming right. ass bass speakers and all i was jealous of my friends they had the five disc changer and all this <laughs> stuff so I got those too, but yes, I, I had think, a record player. I'm a little older than you. I mean, people love records, man. They're back. You know, vinyl is a thing, and records are like vinyls are rich. It's like a vanilla to your ears. You know, it's a uh, it's a good thing. But um, yeah, no. Hopefully, we'll see that more going forward. I really think they do. They they need to. It, it, you, there's a, I feel there's a been generations of people left like they go out there in the real world and they don't know how to start business. They don't know how to manage any of this. You just got to, like you said, kind of self-educate if that's what you want to do. But we've also been seeing a shift toward that. You know, we were talking about the micro brews right now, younger generations getting out there, starting their business, new coffee businesses, and, and, and not just like coffee shops, but there's a uh, gigawatt coffee is out there now. I don't know if you heard about them, no. but they're, uh, I was just at uh, five rabbit Cervecheria for a charity event um within the last month or two and gigawatt uh coffee was one of the sponsors and they do they do i think they uh air fry their coffee beans so they said the reason that you get like real bitter coffee like starbucks is because they over roast or they roast it in a certain way where they don't get that with their coffee so if you happen to see them out there they're uh, headquartered out here in the suburbs. I can't remember where, a little a little farther north, but... Uh, yeah, check it out. Yeah. I do enjoy coffee. I can't make it every morning, at least something. I don't blame you, brother. Well, I, I can't really drink coffee anymore, 
I have kind of a caffeine intolerance. Uh, I had a like premature heartbeat due to sleep apnea. I kind of developed mm-hmm. over time with the irregular breathing, and but you know before the sleep apnea got real bad, I oh, I love Dunkin' man. Yeah, good coffee in the morning can get you going. Dunkin' is uh, grade C coffee. I like the Black Rifle. Is what I like to do drink you like in the it? morning at the house, yeah. Rogan's always talking about that one on the podcast. And I like what they're doing as a company, too. So they're doing some pretty good stuff out there in the community. So I like to support that stuff. They're a veteran, um, yeah. veteran-owned coffee company? Right. What, uh, what initiatives do they have? Well, recently I just saw something. There was a, I think it was Sheriff. I think it was out in Texas or somewhere down south that had gone and asked the local county commissioners for some funding for a boat to do search and rescue. And one of the commissioners, we'll just say, was uh, not having it, was kind of insulting, said, oh, you just wanted a brand new shiny toy to the sheriff who'd had like three murder investigations where the bodies were located on the water and they had to use, you know, regular boats. So he's asking for a search and rescue boat, something specially kitted for a uh, uh, sheriff's department. And Black Rifle was like, oh, well, if you guys won't vote for it, here's a check. Go buy your boat. Here's for the training. Here's for the equipment. So the boat was like twenty grand. Then the company cut like a $32,000 check to the sheriff's department for that. So I thought that was pretty cool. I'm down with that. I'll support that any day of the week. For sure. Yeah. And I heard the coffee's really good. Like I said, I can't really drink coffee anymore. Otherwise, I'd definitely try it. Yeah. But I heard it's delicious. Very good. Nice and rich. A couple different varieties, too? or I don't know. I just grabbed the one off the shelf. <laughs> and you brew at home or at the office? Or? At the house. Yeah. At the house. Yeah, I got a grinder. I like the beans. Make it fresh. Something, you know, a little thing in the morning. For sure. We, when I was still able to drink coffee, or even when I kind of wasn't able to, I switched to decaf, and even that I can't really drink now because decaf doesn't mean no caffeine at all. Right. It just means much greatly, greatly reduced. We we would get we got the grinder too. We were down in uh, Florida at a wedding, and our Uber driver was you know taking us around Fort Myers or whatever, and he's like, "Dude, get the grinder." He's like, "Get that at home." So like, get your beans, crush them up, and we did. It's the way to go. You yeah, know? next level, for sure. So we mentioned that the eviction moratorium, as of right now, is going to end in August in Illinois. Right. And, uh, you know, who knows if that'll get pushed back farther. If it does get pushed back any farther in August, that's probably going to be the last time. I don't know how they'll be able to justify extending it beyond August because we go out there right now, people are back to work. Yeah. I mean, I know obviously there's like a labor issue as well with pe- getting people back to certain positions or whatever, but people are back working. The traffic is traffic as busy as it's ever been. Yeah. yeah. So people are back working. I don't know how they could justify extending it on any farther. In fact, even with the moratorium we had, which to your point, yeah, you needed to kind of feel things out. We were in this uncharted territory of this is the first time in our modern civilization um, in the past hundred years that we've had a pandemic we've had to manage and deal with right. and figure out what's what. We didn't know how bad it was going to be. It could have been, when, when that coronavirus first hit, it could have been as bad as Ebola or whatever. Obviously, we found out pretty quickly it wasn't that bad. But we didn't know as things played out. Obviously, our, our health care system was at max, max, max capacity. Um, but now that we know that uh, you know we're, we're kind of past that, um, I I don't see how they could really justify moving it much farther because people are back working. What I don't get is why the income levels were so high on the moratorium. So like, and that was only after a modification because initially, even if you were making millions of dollars, you couldn't get evicted. So eventually, after about eight or nine months, they said, okay, if you're making a hundred thousand dollars or more, we can do it. You know. So, so it was the income level, you can't get evicted unless you made under $100,000 as a household? Yes, yeah, so... Or, par- or pardon me, you can't get evicted unless you made more than right. $100,000 right. as a household. Because the idea is, is that if you're pulling in that kind of coin, you can afford it. And if you're just not cutting the check, well, that's not fair. You're taking advantage of the situation. And every day I get a phone call from some homeowner, some you know mom and pop 
two flat owner in Chicago saying, I don't know what I'm gonna do. They haven't paid in a year. I'm owed twenty thousand dollars. I'm still having to make my payments on my mortgage and stuff and my taxes and my water bills and you know, what can I do? And my answer always is stop voting for crappy politicians because this is unconstitutional. The federal moratorium uh, was declared unconstitutional in the last 60 days or so. And I think that the way the governor's trying to play this out is that they created some money with the CARES Act that they got to help with rental assistance. Of course, Illinois, I don't think they ruled it out well because it required participation of the tenants and the landlord. They really should have just had it landlord driven to say, look, I haven't gotten paid, uh, tenants not cooperating, and I need some rental assistance. And they didn't do that. A lot of these programs required the tenant to be involved, and a lot of the tenants were like, no, I'm not going to fill out the paperwork. So now the landlords are out the money. And in many cases, these tenants are uncollectible. So even if you take a judgment against them, you know, they're not caring what their FICO score is. And in some cases, you know, that's why they're tenants. They never paid too much attention to their financial obligations, and they're stuck in that trap. Yeah, that's that's the interesting part. I I feel like, you know, they, that that income level for stopping the eviction should have been much much lower than a hundred thousand dollars. Are Absolutely. you kidding me? Like, if this person's not going to pay you, if they can demonstrate that they're unemployed at that time, I get it. They got a hardship. But the problem, to your point, is some of these people were still working. I was getting calls too, and I'm not an eviction attorney. Uh, I know some basics about it. But I was getting calls saying, like, look, I still see this guy leaving every morning. Like, yeah. I know I know he's working. He says, well, you know, they said we don't have to pay me because of the moratorium. Right, which wasn't the case. I mean, it was very clear that if you were still working, you were supposed to do it. But without an enforcement mechanism, it puts the landlords in a horrible spot. And if you live in Chicago with some of the other ordinances that they passed, you know, you'll get stuck as a landlord if you try to enforce it in court. I had one young lady who filed two actions against two tenants, did so on an emergency basis because the tenants were hoarding debris at the property. One tenant left the water running, you know, stopped up the sinks, water was it overflowing. Flooded, flooded the place. Um, yeah, they got a call that there was a funny smell and her parents who lived a few blocks down went over lady left the gas on you know with no uh flame just the gas pouring out so some of these tenants were outrageous and if you take it to the judge the judge is like well i don't think that qualifies as health and safety you're like okay i guess i just have to deal with a flooded building that blows up so some of it was really crazy i would think that that would qualify for health and safety if that doesn't i don't know what does exactly Ex yeah. exactly because how could there's certain problems that will exist, and I think they'd be more minor than something like that, right. that you could get an eviction, a successful eviction on a, on a health and safety issue. We have a very biased residential landlord-tenant ordinance in Chicago. It's very unfair if you're a landlord. It imposes way too many restrictions upon the reasonable exercise of a fair bargain for exchange. You know, you got a tenant says, I'll pay you X amount of dollars per month, your obligation as a landlord is to apply a you know clean, comfortable, well-regulated unit. And when you break that, it imposes all kinds of costs. There's going to be a lot of landlords that are going to have to raise rents to catch up for all the money that they've lost. And longer term, the bigger issue we're going to have as a city is the affordability of rental properties. And it's, a, it's an issue government created, so it's going to be a real mess. Yeah, and they were trying to solve it by, like, uh, rent control, and it's like... Rent control isn't the way to go. No, not at all. It's not the way to go. No. Um, because after everything the landlords have been through, especially currently, how can you tell them, like, if you're going to keep on increasing taxes here, who are you to tell me how much I can charge? Like, may as well let the government take over all the apartments and let them rent it out. Then they can figure out how much they want to rent it for. But they... 
who are they to tell you know people how much they can charge for an apartment? Well, we have a lot of people like that in city government now. These progressives, which are really socialists, and what you described as essentially socialism, where the government regulates the private ownership of those uh, properties. But you know, we always got to remember that no matter what, most people who buy a building intend to use it as a method of supporting them in retirement, something to pass down to their kids something that supplements their income because maybe they have limited education but got a good job as maybe like a machinist in a factory or something like that you know and they saved up that was their first building they did well they kept it they paid it off and now they're going to use that into retirement you take that away i mean who would build what would be the point if the government's going to come in and tell you what kind of numbers you can get from rent the whole idea of a free market system is the, you know, fair exchange of individuals, some who want to buy, some who want to sell, and they make a mutual exchange. The government coming in and regulating that, uh, I think, is a bad thing, and it's going to lead to horrible consequences, especially in the housing market. I agree. Um, mo- probably many of the problems that we have here um is due to government interference it, it, we probably need a lot less of it especially oh, yeah. in chicago i mean in illinois in general we pay a corruption tax yeah and um it's going to continue to be that way um because of the all the seeds that have been sown through the many years and then you know obviously now whoever's in power deals with that as well um it never shocks me to see how much chicago cook county illinois voters vote against people who are against our interests. It, I never seem to be shocked. Yeah, I think there, there may be a shift in that going forward, but unfortunately in Illinois, we have one of the strongest machines that the world, the country has ever seen, you know. Yeah, it's not like this everywhere else. No, certainly not. I mean, even, even outside of Chicago and Cook County, you, you want to get into respectability with less corruption and stuff, go to the page or will or one of these places, right. you know, where uh, you don't have what we have here. But uh, I'll probably have you back on again. We'll just have a chat about like less government sometime. I'm, <laughs> I, you know, I didn't, I took a test in college. It was just like uh, when I took political science courses at UIC under Dick Simpson, who, if you ever want to talk about, yeah. I might actually ask him to be on the podcast because. You want to talk about government corruption and he's people guy. fight it like he yeah he's just the you know he's he's your guy um but i think it was one of the classes we had there and they were like take a test and find out like what your political leanings are and i remember taking the exam and they're like you're a civil libertarian and i was like what the mm-hmm. hell is what does that mean i was like i didn't even know what it meant it's just that what, whatever way i answered the questions are like oh you're you know a civil libertarian and <coughs> pardon me I guess that's just the way what I got from my dad about, like, you know, government and everything. Um, But in any event, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of, especially here in Illinois, too much government. And we need less of it and let people make those decisions for themselves. And I think we'd we'd have a lot better place. But like I said, maybe we'll do that another time. But let's dive into uh, going forward now that the eviction moratorium will be lifted within the next few months. What can you tell people in terms of advice to help them and what can you do for people going forward assisting them now that this is going to be back to even though it wasn't great under the current RLTO which we might have to revamp that going forward I know there's been push for a while we're going to have to look at that because the the weight is so skewed against landlords uh, and over minor violations you can be in trouble for not paying the right interest or not sending out the letters and all this stuff but going forward, what do people need to do in terms of start serving people, uh, notices, and getting the ball rolling on finally getting your property back? You know, the very first thing is to look to your second step before your first step. So eventually you're going to get the tenant out, and we'll talk about that in a sec. But already now you should start making sure that you educate yourself on the fundamentals of the RLTO, the Chicago Residential Landlord Tenant Ordinance. 
tons of resources available online, especially from the city pages. Read through it, understand it, because you're going to eventually displace the current tenant. And you have to understand the next tenant may have been doing the same thing for somebody else. There's actually some ordinances that are passing their way through uh, the city council saying essentially that all of the eviction files should be sealed for about 18 months. So that way someone who wasn't paying gets the benefit of not having paid during the pandemic. And then if they do get evicted, it won't be in the public record right. for the next landlord to find out that this person was skimping out. It totally ruins the free market because if you could make a knowing decision, you would not get involved with this person. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And that's just a matter of fairness. You just want to make sure that you're getting the benefit of your bargain. So that that's going to be a mess. Get now a copy of the RLTO, understand it, read it, and then have a service that you can hire to do the background check. You know, make sure that they've got good income, make sure you're doing really good diligence about, you know, uh, checking financial references. You know, I did a, a flip of my house and I was staying literally two doors down from here. And I really appreciated the landlord as an attorney who does a lot of eviction work he asked for copies of my bank statements and my paycheck stubs, and he pulled my credit and did all kinds of stuff. And I said, oh, good. You know, he's never going to have a bad tenant because you screen out the vast majority of people who are like that. Number one thing I get from a lot of landlords is, well, I've been doing this for 10 years. I never had to evict anybody. Well, time's up. You know, you played the law of averages, and this is what happens. So that would be the first thing I'd recommend. Really, landlords are going to have to be more sophisticated. They're going to really have to know how to get a good tenant in for the next go around. If you have a tenant in there who's now in there, it's always a good idea to have a conversation and say, look, in the next month or so, you haven't been paying. I will file an eviction against you. You haven't given me any cooperation. You didn't fill out any of these forms that you were supposed to. I gave you a rental assistance application. You didn't help out. You're behind tens of thousands of dollars. You know, you're going to have to make a decision. Are you going to stay or are you going to wait until the court comes and kicks you out? And a lot of landlords have to understand that once the courts do open for evictions, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be an unmitigated disaster because you're going to have... And I've seen some numbers like 20,000, which might be a little high, but maybe not. 20,000. People who are going to be running down to the courthouse to file these eviction actions to get these non-paying tenants out. And that's 20,000 people who might have multiple tenants that are going down there to file against multiple tenants. So this is right. a multiple right. issue. Right. So the courts are starting to look at mediation programs. The courts are starting to look at alternative dispute resolution to try to get some of them from not having to go to trial. So they're working on a system to put that in place. But realistically, even in pre-COVID times, it would take about six months to evict somebody. And I do predict that it might be up to a year now as we get back to that for a lot of these tenants to have to get out. So be prepared for it, you know, get, get to know the ordinance, so that way, as you begin to serve these notices upon the tenants, you've already reviewed the rules, you know what's going on, you know how to do it. Generally, if you have a written lease that's expired, you can serve a 30-day notice. But of course, now with the pandemic, you can't. So you're going to have to kind of wait until that moratorium lifts. Currently, the moratorium is in place until the 26th of June. Um, when the governor rolled out money for rental assistance last month in May, he did say that by August it would be gone. So I do expect at the end of the month there will be a final extension. So July is going to be pretty hot. A lot of people are going to start having a conversation of, okay, well, what are we going to do now? And it would be better that they do it in August rather than waiting until September, kids are in school, all that kind of thing. So you mentioned six months prior to the pandemic six months would be about how long it would take for eviction but just to be clear that's if the tenant lawyered up and got a defense uh, attorney for their eviction you know not really i mean so 
So I got to give a notice to a tenant, five days. Then I take it down to the courthouse. I had to give it to the sheriff, 30-day return date. Maybe the sheriff would hit. I would say about 40% of the time it hit. And if not, got to go back and get a special process server, another 30 days. Another 30 days. So now you're two months in. Now you're two months in. So then you get your first court date. Maybe the tenant comes in and says, oh, I need more time to get a lawyer. Another month. Another month return date. Yeah. You know, initially, like about three years ago, four years ago, it was a month. um, Before the pandemic, they started to say, hey, look, 14 days, come on back. But now you got 14 days. And then if that lawyer came in and if they filed motions, calendar suits under the RLTO, which is very tenant friendly, very anti-landlord. Um, so then you'd have another date and then maybe another date 30 days out and then you'd come to an agreement because most cases do settle and then you had a date where they would say okay well we'll be out by two weeks from now three weeks from now and then finally they'd be out and if the tenant didn't show up and you got your judgment there was a stay which meant that you couldn't take the paperwork down to the sheriff's office for 14 days 30 days what was the stay for the stay would allow the tenant to leave after the judgment order had been entered. It gave them breathing space so that they could eliminate their items from the property. How long was the stay on average? You know, initially I had a lot of them that were 30 days, but again, just like the court date to come back with a the lawyer, they started dropping it to about 14 or so. So, but again, another half a month. And then you'd have to take it down to the sheriff's office and then they would go and then they would serve it and that alone took six to eight weeks right so you could see that timeline it's every step along the way was very painful and all states are not like this a lot of these states you file your action you go before the judge and the judge would tell the tenant all right well did you pay no why not i didn't pay all right judgment entered 48 hours you know, other states are very quick about that. That's really quick. Yeah. For, 48 hours is very quick. I could see 30 days to relocate and quit quit the property, remove your stuff out of there because it's not easy to, that's a big life shift as to where you're going to be living your life and just, you never realize how much stuff you have until you move. Then you got to shift it all around. Like, Jesus Christ. So now not only do you have to find a new place, get into that agreement and move all your stuff. So 30 days for a move out, I could see is reasonable. To get an attorney nowadays, like you said with Google, go on your phone, type in you know, landlord tenant attorney, and you'll find a million of them within. It doesn't take you know thirty days to get an attorney. That's ridiculous. Right. Like a a week or two weeks. It should be like a get your attorney in here within like a week or two weeks for sure. Right. Uh, at least moving out, I could see a little bit longer. But yeah, thirty day stay before you can even then go to the sheriff. Right. And another six to eight weeks after you give it to the sheriff, after you've paid another fee. Yeah, and pay another fee, then the sheriff goes out there and to then do the physical remove, eviction. Yeah, physically and, removes our stuff out. You know, they don't even do that anymore. They stopped doing that about maybe three years ago, where they would actually empty the premises, uh, but maybe they had too many workers' comp claims from. The sheriff's, the sheriff's department. Oh, I heard my back stuff with the out, right. lifting. The, now the sheriffs are doing movers work or whatever. Right. So now I think it's a better system because they basically say, look, they put the tape on the door. Tenant, you're evicted. If the tenant violates, now it's a criminal trespass. So there's that. And it allows the landlord to say, well, I've got your stuff. You chose not to leave. There's a consequence. How much do you want to buy your stuff back for? You know, so there's a lot of that going on. We're going to put a pin on it for a second. We'll be right back. We're back. So just to summarize what we just covered, the eviction moratorium is likely going to be lifted in in August. Mm -hmm. So um, landlords should be thinking about not only getting the current tenant out, but then what's your next move after that? Right. And so, like you said, some tenants will be uncollectible. You have to cut your losses and move on, unfortunately. Um, And then you also made the point of the information that you should be collecting. I have a friend who is a landlord, and he told me that he was going to start requesting bank statements as well to try to see the history 
of the payment of the rent on a certain date. Oh, what was your old rent at the, the place? Okay, and what was the landlord? And then you'd see that line item on their bank statement showing that that rent was paid at a certain time. Right. You know, you have to manage it as a business, and a business requires as part of its operation to make sure that the cash flow stream is consistent. If you have a tenant who's not used to being consistent, that will result in issues with your business of being a landlord. So what I find is that most landlords can deselect tenants by requiring all of these documents as part of their application package. And what you're really looking at is just the numbers. You say, look, have you been good? Have you been paying your bills? At the end of the month, you got $3 left, or do you have an extra month or two worth of rent? You know, that's very important to see how people manage their money because eventually it will come to whether or not they're going to pay you on time, pay you at all. And in a situation where there's this, you know, global catastrophe, then you have to make sure that they can survive it or at least manage through it. So getting good financial information, social security numbers, driver's licenses, find out who the next of kin is, getting a full credit report, you know, all of that is super important as a uh, landlord. I mean, as such, you got to think like a bank. So the bank doesn't just give you money because you're good looking. They don't give you money just because you come by and you say hi. I'd give you a loan. <laughs> good looking. <laughs> well, thank you very much. But you have to make sure that if you're going to take that risk, because you're really talking about giving a loan of maybe 15 grand, right? A thousand something a month. So you want to make sure that that gets paid. And the best way to manage it is up front. There will be a lot of folks who say, well, this guy wants my bank statements, my check stubs. They want me to fill out all this application. Yeah. Right. Very and, intrusive. And they, oh, that's too much. I don't want to give that. Okay, good. Another tenant will. Because the person who doesn't want to do that probably knows that there's a skeleton in the closet that's going to come tumbling out. So you want to make sure that people who are proud of their credit history, people who are proud of their payment history, uh, to make sure that they've you know comply with all their other financial obligations, that those are the good risks. What do you do with a person who tries to dodge service when you're trying to give them notice of... You know, whether it's the initial notice that, hey, you haven't paid, you have five day notice now to pay rent or quit. How do you how do you handle that? Well, that's got to be one of the challenges. I would think that's one of the main challenges people deal with. So there's a couple of different ways. My preferred way is by the time that you're serving a notice, I like to get the landlord out. So I have a process server that I like to use. Most landlords, you should also track what kind of vehicle the person drives license plate number, make, model, that type of thing, because that way it's easier for the process server if they drive by and they see the, you know, white Honda, you know, license plate, XYZ, whatever, you know, the process server can make a good determination if they're home or not. Try to find out, you know, hey, what kind of hours do you work? You know, where do you work at? Because you can serve a person at their employer. So if you have that employment information because you took a good app, yeah. you can serve them there too. And that really gets the tenant's attention when, you know, the process server walks in, hands them the paperwork in front of their employees, you know, coworkers. That gets their attention. So um, recently my process server, you know, before all this, he had a lady literally jump out a window to run down the block because she was trying to evade. So That's so it, crazy. It was like a tw it was like a ten foot jump too. God. He's like I've never seen this in years. He's like, I don't understand. I just was having your documents. And she jumped out the window. So it was kind of strange. Well, that's crazy because even <laughs> a 10 foot drop. Like, right. You, you could get seriously your, hurt. <laughs> break a whole bunch of stuff. Seriously yeah. hurt. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. Well, this particular lady ended up having a lot of other issues. She actually is uh, in jail now because she was driving down uh, one of the streets over there downtown and just crashed into the park and. There was a fatality in the vehicle. So people are in crisis a lot of times. And so as a landlord, you got to realize that. And, you know, I don't recommend that landlords go and personally serve a five-day notice, especially with a tenant who's been difficult. Just have a professional do it. 
you know, spend a hundred bucks, just get it done. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, because for some people, I've said, yeah, you know, you got to serve this. But I was going to. That was one of the questions I was going to ask you is if they should do it themselves or not. Quite honestly, if you're already in the hole for all the missing rent, you may as well just spend the hundred dollars to have a good process server go out there and do it themselves, whether it's at the home or at their employ, you know, place of employment. Right. Well, you know, the bigger thing is one of personal safety, which is that some of these tenants don't do well when you serve them with the notice. They get in your face, you know, they may become physical and aggressive, and then they don't answer the door because they know it's you, and they know why you're there. So, you know, a lot of times the detective will show up, the licensed private detective will show up and maybe have a Domino's pizza delivery jacket on or a ruse. Don't give away sort. all the secrets. Yeah. <laughs> and he'll be like, oh, wait, I didn't order a pizza here in the box. You got, you know, your five-day notice or whatever. Yeah. So there's lots of little ways to deal with that. Well, so, yeah, and then your first notice, um, there's a couple of different kinds. You can have a five-day notice for not paying the rent. Right. Uh, you can have a 10-day notice for breaching some other covenant or promise within the lease agreement or Correct. you can have a 30-day notice if you're on a month-to-month -month oral lease right uh, you can give a 30-day notice or if you have a written lease that's expired you can also do a 30-day notice because on an expired lease the tenants become a month-to-month -month tenant on Correct. the same terms that they had previously Correct. After and under Illinois, or actually under a new ordinance in Chicago, depending on how long they've been at the property, that notice is now 60 days and I think 90 if it's been like more than five years. So it's no longer just a regular 30. They actually get even more time now. So for long-term tenants, right. whether Who've they had an expired... Month. Yeah, who were on a month-to-month, -month, whether it was an expired lease or it was originally a month-to-month, -month, but if they've been there... right. And do you know the exact time limit, how many years they had to be there? You know, I haven't looked at it since that was passed, like, around this time last year because, you know, we haven't enforced them. But now the notice is even longer. And how long do you say, 60 days? It's up to 60 days, I believe it is. Yeah, I'd have to double check. So yeah. it's quite a bit of time. That is a long time, yeah, getting even extra time. As if the current landlord tenant warrants wasn't uh oppressive enough or yeah yeah right i, I was gonna say uh yeah skewed enough toward the tenants or whatever oppressive i guess would be it. and it certainly is for anybody who out there who thinks you know it's all rainbows lollipops and sunshine when you're a landlord you don't get that income coming in uh or getting tenants in there so then and then and then after the initial notices are served the five day 10 day 30 day or 60 day What's the next notice? And they have to also be given notice of the actual eviction. So now you have a process server going out there twice. Once a case is filed, they have to be the served with the complaint. The sheriff will go out there at first. And then if the sheriff doesn't get them, then you got to get a process server. A special process server. Right. And so sheriff misses. You have to go back into court then to get court permission right. to have a special process server appointed to then right. go serve them. Correct. Additional time, money, and expense, right? And how many times, on average, or what have you, does a special process server have to attempt to serve the, the tenant? If you give your process server good information, you know, make model of the car, what time these folks are generally coming and going, then if you do it right, maybe once. If you have a tenant who you know, maybe stays at the place two, three nights a week, still not paying the rent. Maybe they stay by their Boo or Bay's house or whatever. Yeah, Boo and Bay. Right. You know, it might be a little bit more. They have a Boo more, and a Bay. Right. Maybe. <laughs> They're two separate. You know, so it just depends. It depends on what's going on with that tenant. But if they're generally living there for the most part, and if you got a good information on their schedule, you can usually get them within the first uh, 30 days of that notice. And in worst case scenario, worst case scenario, what happens if the special special process server is unable to serve, serve? I haven't had that. My guy's usually pretty good about it. But the downside is, is he may have to sit on the house and do a surveillance until they do show up. And then if that happens, obviously you got to pay for it as the landlord. Yeah, I was going to say I don't think a flat rate of a hundred dollars would cover right. Uh, 
you know, a server sitting there, you know, with their binoculars, like an old school right. movie, their coffee and the cigarette, and right. waiting for. Uh, I'm gonna get you, see? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna get you. You see, right. I found them. You see, let me report back to you. You see, right, right, yeah. a little Dick Tracy action there. Those were the good old days. Mm. Um, so yeah, once you got them served, now we're. You'd think that the time for evictions could go up to about a year just because of the sheer volume, volume. that the court system is going to have to deal with? Right. Well, I mean, the sheriff is going to get slammed with a deluge of these tenants that have to be served. So that's going to take a while. And then you're going to move into process server territory. And then after that, you'll get service on some, and then you'll get dates. But then there's going to be so many... I mean, I don't even know what Zoom court is going to look like online with, you know, 100 cases on the docket for an eviction. I think it's going to be insanity. And you, when you say 100 cases on the docket for an eviction, you mean per judge? Per judge. I mean, even beforehand, a judge might have 40 cases or 50 cases, so let's assume it just doubles. I mean, that's going to be pretty intense. You know, I would assume figure, probably doubling, maybe even more. Probably, but if you figure maybe on average 10 minutes per case, 100 cases, you're going to be on that Zoom call for a long time. Yeah, and another sad part about working in Cook County is that it's a blast from the past in terms of Cook County, Illinois, is not up to date with technology. No, not at all. You still we were get the using musty carbon smell papers. of mold in the courthouse when you go in. and Right. Using carbon paper. Carbon paper to make du duplicates of orders. I think the good news is that uh, Ann Burke, who's the chief judge over at the Supreme Court for the state of Illinois, basically just issued an administrative order saying to the extent that we could keep some of the Zoom stuff in place to facilitate interactions with people with the court. Because a lot of people wouldn't show up to court. They couldn't get time off of work, transportation issues. I think for me as a practitioner, it was incredibly inefficient. I would go downtown, so an hour, parking, um, if not the train, you know, all of that stuff, to walk into a courthouse 10 minutes before the judge and then go back to my office. And, you know, as lawyers, we sell our time. That's our commodity. And... You know, I always hated having to charge someone two hours, which was essentially transportation. Now I can do two, three court calls from my desktop and, you know, bill way less. It's more effective for the client. And as me as a practitioner, less carbon footprint, not driving, not taking train and all of that kind of stuff. So that's good, too. Yeah. Well, um, they're just it doesn't seem like even Cook County was like ready for zoom it's like no how could you how can you not be ready for that the judge is going to sit there and they're like their computer is not like fully set up or you can't right. just do a quick training course to get these people ready for zoom right right well at first there was a licensing issue oh you know so they had a question about that then they had to set up all of the courtrooms with the technology they're just way behind the curve everywhere else was able to get it up and running to page the federal yeah. courts they were probably all like, right right up like right. Oh, yeah yeah let's do zoom yeah because here the courts have basically been shut down for a long time yeah, yeah no justice crazy. in cook county illinois on any case yeah while they were really shut bad. down waiting to get zoom ready or whatever it's been really bad how about concealed carry my favorite topic they're talking about um some changes uh as well i feel like there's something I can't remember if it's with the Floyd card law. There is. Yeah, are, are you? Have you heard about that? What's what's going on with that? So, Illinois has a number of different laws on the books to ensure that prohibited persons don't get guns. Illinois doesn't have a issue with not having laws on the books. The issue they have is one of enforcement. Because if you had to enforce it, you'd have a lot of people in the prisons. And housing someone in prison is expensive, and we don't have the money. So what we do is we book them and say, all right, give us a couple of bucks for bond, but you're back out on the street. And a number of these people are 
habitually involved with the criminal justice system and they reoffend and they're back out in the street shooting people acting like fools and causing murder mayhem and chaos so the issue isn't that we need more laws the issue is we need to enforce what we've got and pay the cost of incarceration for the offenders but illinois takes a different approach and what they do is they say lawful gun owners should have more restrictions upon them so currently in illinois what's supposed to happen is is you pay a ten dollar fee get a firearm owner identification card that's a card that i think only one state other than us has and it was created back in the 60s to make sure that quote and quote certain people didn't get guns so as i think some racial background in terms of prohibiting people from getting guns but it's supposed to cost ten dollars take 30 days now it's taking like 120 days if not more for people to get their foids the conceal and carry once you take the course 16 hours then you're supposed to pay 150 for that good for five years and then it's supposed to take 90 days and now they're taking about 146. so the timelines are way in excess of what state statute allows with the FOID in particular they're looking to increase the fee they're looking to add a fingerprint component ah the fingerprint component that's a big one right and of course they're trying to sell it say well if you give us your fingerprints then it'll be easier to renew and this and that but tracking law abiding citizens fingerprints doesn't solve the crime problem because those guns don't show up at the scene do you you know you've got your fingerprints all over your gun you're not shooting people the number of people who are lawful conceal and carry or firearm owner shootings is extremely low. Most of what we have is driven by gun, gang violence, organized criminal activity violence, or wilding. You know, some guy is seeing that his ex girlfriend is with some new dude on social media decides that he doesn't like that and he just goes and lights them up i mean it's craziness there's no respect for life in the city anymore yeah no i agree that um it's the the law-abiding citizens who are getting you know right in general the law-abiding citizens that are getting guns are not the ones we need to worry about there's Absolutely. there's so many other problems there's a lot of societal problems there's poverty problems there's education problems um in terms of you know safe gun ownership and stuff and, and and also value for life you know so there's like a moral um moral education problem there's a lot of problems and granted i i think poverty is probably the biggest of them but that's a multifaceted problem in and of itself so that's a right. kind of a thing for another time but um yes i heard about the fingerprints possibly and i heard one of the chambers of the Illinois Congress wanted to make it mandatory, and the other one was like, we'll just give them incentive in that every time you're, you know, if you give your fingerprints in, every time you purchase a new firearm, your FOID automatically renews, so then it's good for this much longer or whatever. Right. Is there any other new restrictions they're trying to put on that? Every time you turn around in Illinois, there's new restrictions that are being proposed, whether it be the type of guns that you can have. What most people have to understand is that 20 years ago, it was actually more restrictive nationwide. I mean, Texas just went to constitutional carry. They eliminated their training requirement. So long as you're a person of good moral character, you can carry your firearm. And I think that that's okay. I think that's the way it should be. I mean, the 28 words shall not be infringed. Um, they really should mean something. We need to get back to that. Most states now are moving away from regulation I always think as an instructor, you should spend your time as a sane, moral, prudent person and get a lot of training. Even though I teach a 16 hour course, the majority of it is classroom and only about three hours of is, is the training component in terms of live fire and everything else. But you really need to get a lot of practice when you're a shooter, a lot of practice. And that doesn't just include going to the range in a booth. Get out there, take a class, you know, uh, be outside and see what a real world, you know, shooting might look like. 
yeah that's that's where the rubber really meets the road because mm -hmm. you can have a gun you can know how to use it you can use it in a range in a safe and relaxed setting when you got to pull that out in public you know and that decision is already made, like damn i got to use this and then the next question is how and then you got to think about your position of safety and you know not you got the rest people. of your life to pull a gun in a gunfight right and you have to know about how you're going to react well in advance. I mean, look at this mental process you just went through. That's a few seconds, which yeah. you may not have. Sitting in a here in a relaxed environment. Yeah. yeah. You know, what you're seeing in Chicago is multiple offenders, multiple firearms, a wolf pack mentality, coming up to people on the street, swarming them, putting guns in their faces. You know, if you're a permit holder, you have to wait your turn. Yeah, you can't just draw on two, three guys who've got a gun. That would take an extremely high level of competency. I mean, that's a dangerous spot to be in, a horrible spot. Yeah, because you're out number three to one right. with three different minds working against your one mind. Correct. So now you have to calculate for three of them. Are you in a good position from the start? You're right. probably already at a You're behind the power curve, yeah. Oh, for sure. Bigly. So what Bigly, you need to yeah, do is... They have this plan already in place, and you're having to react to that plan. So it's already a power dynamic uh, right. curve that shifted against you. It's like Mike Tyson once said, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. Yeah. You know, so in a gunfight, what you find, though, is is that a lot of these perpetrators, they'll look the other way. They're looking to see if anybody's observing what they're doing. And, you know, if the opportunity presents itself, that's when you got to jump in and, you know, pull your shots. Very I'm dangerous gonna, city. I'm going to put a pin on that for just a second, and we'll wrap up after that. So another issue about the FOID cards is, like you said, there's not many states at all that still have that. and They never had it. They, yeah, never had it in the first place. That did have it for maybe good purposes, maybe discriminatory purposes, which right. is not a good purpose. But what I've heard is that the federal government, when you go to buy a firearm, basically does the same check that the state's doing anyway, so it's duplicative. Right. A 4473 triggers the NICS check, National Incident Criminal Background Check. That could be back in like 30 seconds. It's basically the FBI database. If you do it in Illinois, you're still doing that. If you buy it at, you know, any of the gun stores. Illinois, again, to punish, you know, the gun industry, uh, started regulating federal firearms licensed dealers uh, in the last year, started putting up additional requirements. There are some states that are talking about you have to do audio and video recording of your gun purchase transactions. So then they got to keep that for 30 days. I think that's a horrible infringement upon your rights. You go to the gun store, you want to buy a gun, you know, you want to ask a lot of questions. But then they have to record that conversation for law enforcement to look at later. I think that that's not a good thing. You should stay away from that. Yeah, I quite honestly, I hope that we get to the point where they get rid of the FOID card part of it. I could see for concealed carry. That, that makes sense, right? We want, or at least in terms of the educational requirements, about not every person growing up gets gun safety education at home. I right. did. My father was a big believer in the Second Amendment. My uncle taught me how to shoot. My father taught me how to shoot. Various friends when we'd be in Wisconsin. Right. So I learned it. I learned about, like you said, keeping your finger off the trigger, pointing your firearm in a safe direction. My dad always told me, he says, never point your gun at anything that you don't want to shoot. Right. And so I learned all those things at a young age. Uh, here, though, I, I could see concealed carry educational courses and a licensing for that. But with the FOID card, it's it's just it's duplicative. It's just a way of. It's a barrier. It's a barrier towards the exercise of your fundamental constitutional right. It's a enumerated right. I mean, who here would say that you had to wait 120 days to post something on Facebook or Twitter? You know, because you're limiting. Free speech right. there, but then it yeah. would be gone I got to register if I want to go to church. Nobody would agree with that. But when it comes to the Second Amendment, people are like, oh, yeah, just throw all kinds of restrictions on there. Well, regulate it like we do cars. 
you know, you got to get a registration and all that. That's like insanity in my book. And in the history of the world, what we found is that governments who restrict gun rights tend to be the most oppressive, and those are the ones that you actually need to make sure that you have all your gun rights with. Yeah, and that's why I think my dad was was pro Second Amendment, pro gun rights, is because Ireland, where he came from, had such a long history of oppression by the British. And the first thing the British government would do right. when they came to conquer would be to round up all the guns. Right. Round up all the guns, make people powerless, right. not allow them to mount a resistance, and then just do whatever the hell they want. Right. Rape, pillage, kill, whatever. Right. In their villages. And Prima nocter. What's that? Prima nocter. What does that mean? They take the brides on their wedding night, and uh, the king or the local lord would enjoy relations with the wife on the first night. Well, that's a very nice way of putting it. Yeah. And that's terrible. Yeah. Well, I learned a new word today. Prima nocter. You were probably reading those encyclopedias a lot back then, right? Uh, that and I watched Braveheart. Braveheart, Braveheart. <laughs> Great movie, man. It's been years since i seen it. You can take our lives, but you can't, can't take, take our freedom. freedom. William Wallace. Uh, hey. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so we'll see what happens with the FOID card going forward. That legislation is in the Illinois Congress right now. We'll see how long it takes to get through and right. and play out. Uh, what should people know um, about getting their concealed carry? Um, just in general, what what do you what do you recommend for people to be safe and responsible and exercise the right? Mm, good question. So I think the first thing people need to realize is that. The safety of yourself and your family is your responsibility that if you are relying on the police, police under state law, federal law, Supreme Court decisions don't have an obligation to come in to save you. So if you think that just because you have a phone that that's going to interrupt criminal activity being perpetrated against you, you have another thing coming. There's tons of audio recordings of people being killed while they're on the phone with 911. So that's really not an option in my book. People who decide that they want to incorporate firearms for personal defense into their life have to realize that it's an awesome responsibility. It's a responsibility that you're given under the terms of the Constitution by God himself, a right of self-defense to say if somebody comes against you to perpetrate a felonious act, you have a right to defend yourself on that. But you have to be in the mindset of being ready to exercise that. So I think that does require a certain sort of mental preparation in advance. And if you decide to carry, it really does change where you go because some places are restricted, the type of clothing that you wear to make sure that you're carrying it safely and effectively and in compliance with the law. Training is a big deal. Every round that you fire, you're responsible for. And then in terms of taking the class, I mean, the Illinois class is 16 hours, which is far more than any other state in the union. But the benefit of that is that you can also apply for a number of other states' permits as well, or they'll recognize Illinois because we have such a big training requirement. You should have a firearm that you're comfortable carrying all the time, something that has at least a 10 round capacity because this predatory wolf pack behavior we're seeing of criminals where there's multiple offenders, maybe a six shot revolver is just not gonna get you there if you wanna defend yourself against five or six people. Um, and just be prepared, just be prepared. In an age where they're defunding the police, in an age where proactive police enforcement of the laws is essentially dropped to nothing, you're responsible for your own safety and you need to be responsible for your own safety. It's it's true and I think now more so than ever before, we're very fortunate that things did not get worse with civil unrest during this pandemic because, you know, in our city, Minneapolis, uh, things were very bad for a while and it, they could have got worse with the, in terms of the civil unrest and what are you gonna do then? Um, when the uh, Memorial Day last year, I was listening to the police scanner, and I had just gotten back. It was just, it was the Monday right after the Memorial Day, or excuse me, 
It was within a few days of Memorial Day ending. I just got back, and the civil unrest here was crazy. And uh, I turned on the police scanner, and it sounded like Armageddon was happening out there. I'm not kidding you. It yeah. sounded like something out of a 28 Days Later movie. It right. was panic. You know, we won't respond here because there's nothing, like, violent going on there, even though, you know, the looting or the, there was a car dealership where they were just, like, driving cars through right. there, taking out the keys and driving the cars away. Uh, really crazy. And to your point, you're the only one responsible for your own defense at the end of the day. Right. If people think that, like, you can call the police and that'll solve the problem, they're reactive and they're coming after a problem has already happened most of the time. It's not like you're going to get lucky when you're being robbed or you're being shot or you're being you're in a gunfight that they'll just be there and you'll be lucky. Even the police aren't that lucky sometimes that they have people around or back up when they're in the middle of that. Right. So sometimes you have to be your own police and you got to be ready for that and you got to do it in a responsible way. Right. And also to your point too, people don't realize why do you need a gun with so much ammunition in it? Well, the studies that I've heard about trained police in, I mean, these are police. Obviously the police probably need more training than they get by a long shot as well. Way more. Yeah. They need a lot. I've heard something like recommendations are they should be in training 20% of the time that they're on the clock. That's probably accurate. So 20% of the time in a de-escalation 20% of the time in armed just to jujitsu or right. some kind of combat so they know less how to handle lethal. themselves. Yeah, less than lethal. And then also with their guns. So um, the reason you need such a high mag capacity is I've heard that police in gunfights are only accurate 20% of the time. Yeah, yeah, that's the FBI statistics. It's the rule of threes, um, usually three yards, three seconds, three shots. That's your average gunfight, you know, but that's law enforcement statistics. So for the average citizen, when you're the target of a mob attack, those dynamics are going to be off. And a handgun is an incredibly underpowered tool of lethality. I mean, you think about a gun being very dangerous, shot placement obviously being very important, but a gun is really just a hole puncher. And if you don't poke the holes in the right areas of the body, you might need multiple hits to stop the offender. And only central nervous system or critical organs will do that. And most folks in a second when they're, you know, sipping their latte and now they got a gun in their face at the window of their car, you know, you're not going to respond, you know, necessarily with your best foot forward. You're just you're in one zone now immediately you're in the red and you have to navigate through that and uh it will generally take multiple shots to stop an offender so if you have four offenders and you got six rounds in your gun and let's say you hit every one of them which you should two rounds may not be enough to take down some bad guys fortunately most criminals are cowards and once they hear return of gunfire, they do take off running. They leave their friends behind, leave them to die. You know, they're, there's no honor among thieves. But um, for the most part, that's what you're going to find. You need to have at least that. I carry 15 plus one plus a spare mag, and that's really the minimum I'll generally walk around with. That that makes sense to me. Right. 15, well... Not necessarily the number of actual bullets, but definitely have an extra mag as well. Yeah. Don't forget, magazines do fail. So a magazine is there for additional ammunition or in case of a failure. So it serves two purposes. Well, my good man, if shit ever goes down, you're the guy I'd like to have around, quite honestly. I want to hang out with lot. you just more often <laughs> just to feel safe, you know? Right. I get that a lot. Like, some people want to roll with their entourage. Like, the gangsters, like... Let me hang around with Felix Gonzalez. He's got my back, and my guy Richie, he carries his nine. You know, like, yeah. those are the guys I want around when shit gets thick, you know yeah. what I mean? You know, it's just about being safe. I care about my friends. I care about my family. I want everybody to do well. I want them to be prosperous. And I don't want people who don't have respect for that to take that or their lives away. Well, thank you very much for sharing your perspective and your knowledge. Uh... It's been great to get to know you better over time, so I, I look forward to having you as a friend going forward. Yeah. 
happy Father's Day to you. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that, man. No problem. Go enjoy. Go get a nice bite to eat with the family and take a little something home to sip later on and relax. Do. And let me know how you like it. I will. All right. Stay blessed. And uh, tune in next time, everybody. Peace. Peace.